Good afternoon. My name is Michaela O'Brien, and I will be your moderator for this workshop. Welcome to the workshop, Medical Marijuana and Transplant. What do we know? I'd like to introduce our speaker for this session, Dr. Allison Carulli. Dr. Carulli is a hematology oncology pharmacy specialist at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, where she participates in a daily monitoring of patients on the leukemia and allogeneic stem cell transplant inpatient oncology unit. Her research includes a pilot program studying the safety and feasibility of using rescue therapies for CAR T cell therapy patients who develop cytokine release syndrome and HLH like syndrome. Dr. Carulli is a member of the American Society for Transplantation and Cellular Therapy, the Hematology Oncology Pharmacy Association, and she is a peer reviewer for the Journal of Hematology Oncology Pharmacy. Please welcome Dr. Carulli. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so I appreciate that. So today, as I was just mentioned, we're gonna be going through medical marijuana and stem cell transplant, and what do we know? So we're gonna kinda of try to go through a big over overview of marijuana in general, going through the legalization status in the United States, which will be kind of where we're primarily going to focus is the United States information. I'm um, looking at the available products, routes of administration, marijuana's place in therapy, and use in symptom management, looking at those more relevant and long-term side effects of patients um, who have had transplants, and looking at drug interactions uh, between medical marijuana and more commonly used post-transplant medications. So medical marijuana is an extract of the plant cannabis sativa. And just to get us on the same page with definitions, when we say medical marijuana, we're talking about the leaves, the stems, the flowers, and seeds of all the species of the cannabis plant. And this plant contains over 400 components, but the ones we are mostly concerned with are the cannabinoids. There are two main types of cannabinoids, phytocannabinoids and endocannabinoids. Endocannabinoids are produced by our own body, and phytocannabinoids are the ones that we're going to be focusing on today. They come from plants, and there are two that are the most studied, tetrahydrocannabinol, or aka THC, and cannabidiol, aka CBD. THC is the psychoactive one, meaning that that's the one that's gonna cause people to get that high feeling for medical marijuana, and CBD doesn't really have that effect. So medical marijuana works by binding to cannabinoid receptors, and there are two main cannabinoid receptors that we focus on, CB1 and CB2. Where these receptors are located is gonna really help us understand the potential benefits and side effects of medical marijuana. Now, while there is some overlap, not everywhere has both receptors, and this picture is divided by three colors to show that. The purple lines are where CB1 receptors are located, and I wanna draw your attention to the fact that CB1 receptors are located in your brain, so you can see why you might get some mood changes with medical marijuana. And CB2 receptors are in red, and notice that, well, that your white blood cells have CB2 receptors on them. So that's gonna be really important to think about with side effects and treatment, because we don't want anything suppressing people's white blood cells after a transplant. And then the green lines are pointing to parts of the body that contain both CB1 and CB2 receptors. And as you can see, the stomach and the digestive tract have CB1 and CB2 receptors, which is why some people might find medical marijuana is helpful with nausea, vomiting, or appetite. And they're also in the heart, so that's something that we're gonna to have to think about with potential side effects. So with that many potential places for marijuana to work in the body, it's kind of easy to imagine that it's had a lot of uses throughout the years. And it's definitely been years. Marijuana has been around for tens of thousands of years. It's believed to have originated in the Northeastern Tibetan Plateau with the earliest reports of use was in 10,000 BC. 
And there are multiple reports of ancient cultures using marijuana in China, India, Africa, Greece, etc. They even found cannabis in an Egyptian mummy, which I think is just really cool. But what they use medical marijuana for seem to vary between the regions and the cultures, but some are similar to what marijuana is being studied for today. For example, one of the most studied indications for marijuana in modern times has been for seizures or for epilepsy, but they figured that out thousands of years ago in India. The ancient cultures also knew of marijuana's potential effects for pain relief and really frequently used it for rheumatic pain, menstrual cramps, and other types of pain. Now, they also recommended it for indications that we know it's not really useful in, like rabies and malaria and tuberculosis and as a pesticide. So they weren't completely correct, but as you can see, marijuana has been a really popular treatment for many years. Unfortunately, though, in the early 20th century, marijuana's place in therapy really became much more controversial in the Western world. And this is partly due to, the more, to more effective medications being produced, inconsistency um, in efficacy between different marijuana plants, and a concern that marijuana had high risks of intoxication and addiction. And now we will be focusing a little bit more on how the United States dealt with these concerns. So legally, they really started restricting cannabis in 1914 with the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act that regulated distribution of opiates and banned prescribing habituated drugs like med medical marijuana. They really took things a lot further in 1937 by banning the use and sale of all cannabis in the U.S. So people who wanted to use cannabis had to register and pay totally separate taxes. And this was a law that made it really difficult for people to use and study marijuana in the United States. And use really declined significantly for a short time. But in the 1950s, really use actually started to really increase again in a more underground fashion though, amongst young people. And this didn't really change the course of federal regulations. And it was categorized as schedule one drug in the 1970s, meaning that there's no accepted medical use uh, based on federal standards. And since then, it's really been very, very difficult to study marijuana for legitimate indications and has really stalled our ability to determine effectiveness in a variety of different diseases. However, there continue to be some interest and a synthetic version of marijuana called dronabinol was approved in 1985 for nausea and vomiting. And really in the last few years, there has been a, like a pretty much complete reversal of public opinion. And California became the first state to legalize marijuana for medicinal purposes in 1996. And recreational use really wasn't approved until 2021 in Colorado and Washington. But as you can see, since 1996, 37 states have legalized marijuana for medicinal use in the US. So this graph kind of depicts where marijuana is legalized medicinally in blue and where it's legalized recreationally and medicinally in purple. So as you can see, it's now really only a minority of states that have not legalized marijuana in some form in the U.S. And now it's estimated that there are at least 35 million Americans that use marijuana on a monthly basis. And over 5 million patients have a medical marijuana card as of 2021. So use and public acceptance has really definitely exploded in the past few years. However, medical marijuana still, I'm sorry, marijuana continues to be considered illegal under federal law and is still a Schedule I drug. Therefore, no one can really actually get a prescription for medical marijuana. Physicians use a loophole to recommend medical marijuana. And even with that loophole, federal restrictions still significantly limit our ability to study marijuana's effects because most because a lot of hospitals and research centers obtain grants from the federal government and they can't perform research on a schedule one drug because of that. So as you'll see later, 
there really isn't enough data on medical marijuana's effects, and that's just one of the limitations that we're really faced with. There's still a lot of education gaps between, because medical marijuana is dealt with so differently compared to other drugs. You know, physicians have to be certified to especially prescribe medical marijuana, and the prescriptions aren't at all what they're used to. Healthcare professionals are really used to prescribing a specific dose and knowing of a medication and kind of knowing exactly what the patient's gonna be getting. But medical marijuana prescriptions don't contain doses, the contents or the type of medical marijuana that um, is being recommended. So they're very, very different. And because the potency varies from plant to plant and product to product, it's really difficult to know exactly what you're getting. The THC and CBD content is going to vary in each product, and quite a few products don't actually even list the CBD content at all. The purity can also vary from dispensary to dispensary and isn't intensely regulated. So that can make physicians and pharmacists like me understandably a little bit nervous. And it makes, us, it, makes it doubly important to try and make sure that everyone goes to a reputable dispensary and tries to stay consistent with what products they're using. And of course, dosing is completely different for each indication in person. So in even marijuana plants, uh, which makes my job so fun. Each plant has a different CBD and THC amount in it, and meaning that people can't, can, can't just say, okay, take this X amount, uh, because it can really vary. And the modes of administration can also really change how much is absorbed in the body and how quickly um, it is, which can really dramatically change the amount someone needs. So all this being said, we really don't know the optimal dosing. And the general mantra is to start low and go slow, meaning start at the lowest dose and increase it slowly until you get symptom relief or side effects. But that uncertainty really means that healthcare professionals are probably more likely to prescribe something that they're more familiar with and can titrate more consistently and really only think of medical marijuana as a second or third line agent. And really, that lack of education probably plays a role in, in this. A group of researchers surveyed medical personality, I'm sorry, medical personnel, personnel that were still in training, so students, residents, and fellows, and found their knowledge in medical marijuana to really be severely lacking. Only about 25% of trainees felt confident enough to answer questions about medical marijuana, and only 5% Felt that they had enough education and training to prescribe it. So have you ever been to a hospital or discussed medical marijuana in detail with a physician in training? You might not have gotten the in-depth education that you really need. But I would definitely encourage you to ask questions um, that you have to your palliative care provider or your oncologist. As you can see on the right, surveys from 2017 to 2019 indicate that they are significantly more confident in the use and prescribing of medical marijuana. 50 to 80% of physicians believe that medical marijuana should be legalized in general. And as you can see, the numbers seem to be more consistent with the palliative care or oncology practitioners. 70% of palliative care workers believe medical marijuana is effective for symptom management and almost 70% of oncologists recommend it as an add-on medication for pain. So clearly physicians who are specialized in symptom management are seeing the benefit of medical marijuana. We just need more data and education. There is some data, though, that has led to the FDA approval of a few agents. So dronabinol and nabilone were approved in the mid-1980s and 2000s, to, to, to target CB1 and CB2 receptors, which were on the picture that we discussed earlier. So they are primarily approved in chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting and age-related anorexia or cachexia. They do have several studies in cancer-related anorexia and cachexia, though, so we do use them fairly frequently. And while they do work particularly well in patients who have found medical marijuana to be effective, most patients say that they're not quite as effective as their medical marijuana. 
but they are readily available. Oral options that can be trialed. So a good so a good option for some patients. Epidiolex is a purified cannabidiol that seems to act on those cannabinoid receptors that we discussed earlier. However, it has a very narrow indication for seizures related to a very severe form of epilepsy and is pretty strictly only used for that indication. So we really have not had access to that medication at all. Sativex, also called nabiximol, is an oral spray that can be given on the inside of the cheek or under the tongue. It's a really unique medication on this list because it's the only medication that actually has THC in it. There are equal parts of THC and CBD in it, but it's, and it's approved in Europe and Canada, but not in the U.S. for multiple sclerosis-related spasticity. The trials required for U.S. approval are actually wrapping up, though, so we may see this agent in the U.S. in the next few years, but for now, we don't have access to it, and medical marijuana is actually easier to get. And there are quite a few medical marijuana options available, and they all have different modes of administration. And this is really helpful because there really is a way to get medical marijuana to everyone, even if they can't swallow or if they can't take anything orally. Um, conversely, though, it can get really confusing and overwhelming with all the options available and which one's best to choose. Every time I turn around, there seems to be another dispensary popping up and different options, um, different types, different flavors, et cetera. So this list is not nearly all as all inclusive, but I did try to include some of the more common routes of administration or some of the more unique ones um, and a few pearls to keep in mind. Depending on the formulation and route of administration, medical marijuana's onset and duration can really vary widely. As you can see, using edibles or oral tablets can have a pretty variable onset, and it also has a, has an avail, a very variable bioavailability, meaning how much is actually absorbed in your body. It can take up to two hours to see an effect with it. So that start low and go slow mantra that I talked about earlier, to find your ideal dose can be kind of hard to figure out um, with this, and you need to be really careful to not just keep taking extra every few minutes until you see an effect. Make sure that you've waited the full two hours before taking any additional edibles to avoid overdoing it. And then in patients who cannot swallow or want a more local effect, there are also quite a few options. Creams and lotions are great options for those who are looking for that more localized effect like if you specifically have a knee or a foot pain or something to that ex extent and want to target that area. There are some debates, though, with these about how much is actually absorbed in your body and how deeply these creams and lotions can penetrate. So, so keep that in mind if it's not working. You might need something that can penetrate a little bit deeper or that affects the entire body. Tinctures are also great options. And they tend to have better systemic absorption, meaning that it kind of goes into the whole body and, and it affects the entire body, than the creams and lotions. If you're having trouble swallowing but want that more systemic effect going into the whole body, there are also different alternatives, but these are less studied. So transdermal, meaning a patch that can be absorbed through the skin and hit every part of the body is an option. But again, less studied and really variable absorption. So it's really hard to titrate this up and down and find out your ideal dose. Suppositories are also available and can be used rectally, but there are limited studies on these. So we have less knowledge about dosing. And the other thing, of course, to consider is your platelets and your white blood cells. We never want to increase the risk of infection or bleeding. And inserting something into the rectum can be associated with moving bacteria to other places or causing physical trauma. So suppositories are really not recommended if you have a low white blood cell count or a low platelet count. But if you can't take any of these, there is one other route of administration that people always think of, probably think of it first, 
And I do want to spend some time on it as I think it's the most common route, um, which is inhaling, smoking, or vaping marijuana. This, on, this, the onset of this one is probably one of the quickest, but unfortunately, smoking or vaping is associated with an increased risk of both bacterial and fungal lung infections. And this is because this method of administration deposits spores in 50% of individuals, and people are three and a half times more likely to develop infections as a result. Particularly if you're immunocompromised, like all people who have recently gotten a transplant or are on any therapy for graft-versus-host disease or are on something to prevent cancer from coming back. And we, have, and we have the case reports to prove that. So the main takeaway from the last two slides are that there are lots of ways to administer medical marijuana, but smoking and vaping are the methods that pretty much everybody, every person in the cancer world is going to recommend against. To switch gears a little bit, I'd like to start discussing side effects. And fortunately, medical marijuana seems to be pretty well tolerated overall. Even though a lot of people actually use it to treat to nausea and vomiting, if you take too much of it, then you can actually cause nausea and vomiting. So that's something to watch out for and a really important side effect to note if you're trying to titrate your dose up. I would say that the most common side effects that everyone thinks of are the ones that affect the brain. The more THC in medical marijuana, the more likely you are to experience some of these side effects. But you can see, still see them to a smaller degree in products that only target CBD. So they are good to keep in mind regardless. The most commonly reported ones are dizziness and tiredness, anxiety, Panic, paranoia, and psychosis are seen more commonly with those higher THC products. Short-term memory impairment is also an issue with medical marijuana, particularly with long-term use. And we don't recommend driving while taking medical marijuana. There have been studies that have shown that people have less motor coordination, meaning that they have slower reaction times in cars and takes longer to perform important functions like stopping a car, um, which is a really important in func uh, function. So definitely don't drive while you're taking medical marijuana. And addiction is also reported in up to 9% of people on medical marijuana, which is actually a lower percent than other medications such as opioids, but something to keep in mind. Other side effects that can occur include elevated heart rates, and decreased blood pressure. There is some concern, and it's really kind of an evolving concern, that there's an increased risk of heart attacks and strokes with medical marijuana. And this is still being studied, but that's something to really discuss with your doctor if you have any sort of heart problems or a history of strokes or anything like that. Um, and then the other side effect is coughing and wheezing, which mostly happens when you're smoking medical marijuana. So again, don't smoke it. Now, I wouldn't be a pharmacist if I didn't want to talk about drug interactions. Unfortunately, though, I don't have a lot of great data to draw upon for drug interactions with medical marijuana. There are generally several ways that we determine drug interactions in the healthcare world. They can make models of the metabolism and the functions of the human body and use like petri dishes to see what happens when medical marijuana is introduced to different modes of metabolism, but those are just models and not a person. And human beings are infinitely more complex than those models. Our genetics, our own metabolism, the, our, the way our organs work, all determine the true relevance of an interaction. So those types of tests using models and Petri dishes tend to be the first steps when looking at a drug to give us an idea of what an idea of what should be happening when we're studying it. Afterwards, most drugs are then tested by giving them to an actual human being and looking at the levels of the drugs in the body um, when you're looking at something that would inhibit them. 
And these are really helpful studies and really the studies that we really need to see what the true interaction is and how concerned we should be. But we don't have those. Uh, due to those legal restraints, differences in CBD and THC contents, because as you can see, they inhibit little different things in the liver, administration routes, and a host of other things, we really don't have these studies yet. So, and because THC and CBD inhibit those different parts of, those, of the metabolism pathways, the true impact of the interactions are likely really individualized based on the product, the dose, and the person. All that means that it's really hard to know what the interactions we should be worried about with are, um, what we should be worried about with medical marijuana are. And we really don't know the clinical impact of any of these interactions. Therefore, I want you to take these next slides with a grain of salt, and they should really only be used to instigate a discussion with your doctor about using medical marijuana so that you both know what to monitor and keep an eye out for. But in general, with interaction for these, for these different agents, we're kind of concerned with three different things. If the medical marijuana increases the level of a transplant medication, then you can get an increase in toxicity or side effects of that transplant medication. And a lot of these transplant medications have a pretty narrow dose range, meaning that they really, you know, they only work at a certain dose and giving any more can cause really bad tox like side effects. So higher levels can be concerning. Conversely, if the levels of the transplant medication are decreased by an interaction with medical marijuana, then there's a higher risk of, medical, of the medication not working. And depending on the medication, that can mean higher rates of breast or host disease, that can mean cancer coming back if you were looking to use that medication to prevent cancer. And on the flip side of both of those, some transplant medications can actually increase the levels of medical marijuana and increase the risk of marijuana side of it. So what I did was I tried to list the most commonly used medications in the graft versus host disease or GDHD world and the theoretical risk. And again, these concerns are still theoretical because of everything we just discussed on the last few slides. But unfortunately, medical marijuana does seem to have an impact on most of the medications used in transplant. The main concern is that medical marijuana decreases the metabolism of the transplant medication. So that means that there's more hanging around in the body for longer. And you might get increased levels of that transplant medication, increasing your toxicity and your side effects. For some of these, we can actually monitor levels for those, like the tacrolimus or the cyclosporin or the sirolimus. But I would definitely still recommend really frequent monitoring when on those medications. And I would pay special attention to monitoring with tacrolimus because this interaction really does seem to be important. Um, there are multiple reports of people starting medical marijuana and seeing their tacrolimus levels shoot up. And that can cause side effects like kidney problems and that type of thing and, and um, can cause some confusion and, and neurotoxicity. So this interaction seems to be very real from the literature and not something that you want to ignore. There's really less data on the other medications, but prednisone, rexolitinib or Jacophy, Valumosidil or Resuroc, Abrutinib or Imbruvica, are very important medications in transplant and can have some you know, concerning side effects to monitor if you get too high of a dose. So again, talking with your doctor is gonna be really important if you wanna start medical marijuana while you're on one of these medications. In terms of anti-infectives, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with after getting a transplant, there are two main drugs that might interact with marijuana. Those are posiconazole or noxifil and voriconazole. And actually here, posiconazole and, and voriconazole actually may decrease 
medical marijuana's metabolism. So you actually might have more medical marijuana hanging around your body for longer and increasing your risk of marijuana side effects. So definitely something to note and monitor. If you start one of these agents, you might actually need less medical marijuana in the long run, or you might get more side effects if you haven't changed your dose after starting these. And then as I'm sure you guys are aware, a lot of people are on medications to keep their cancer from coming back after transplant. And we call these maintenance medications. Um, so I wanted to include the potential interactions with marijuana and these agents that are more commonly seen in ALL, or acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and CML, or chronic my myelogenous leukemia. These include imatinib, aka Gleevec, Desatinib or Spricel, Nilotinib or Tisigna, Basutinib or Busilef, Panatinib or Iclusig, and Asiminib or Semblex. And with these agents, the main concern is that the medical marijuana may decrease the metabolism of the maintenance medication. So that means that there's more hanging around the body for longer and you might get increased levels of the maintenance medication, which can increase your side effects and your toxicity. And a lot of these medications can have a really narrow window where they're effective, but don't cause like very concerning or life-threatening side effects. So again, very important to discuss starting medical marijuana with your doctor if you're on any one of these. They'll probably wanna monitor a lot more closely. I can tell you what those side effects are specifically to look out for, so that you're more aware when you're starting. And these medications are the ones that are commonly used in transplant, um, after transplant for maintenance in acute myeloid leukemia or AML. So they include venetoclax or ventexta, gilteritinib or cisplata, serafinib or nexavar, azacitidine or onurex, anacitinib, or ITFA, an idocitinib, or Tipsovo. Similar to the ones that are used in CML or ALL, the main concern is that medical marijuana may decrease the metabolism of the maintenance medication. So that means that there's more hanging around the body for longer, and you might get increased levels of the maintenance medication. So again, increasing that risk of toxicities and side effects. And this is a concern for all of these agents, except for azacitidine or onurase. Marijuana really doesn't seem to affect that medication. Um, but similar to before, some of these medications can have really narrow windows where they're effective, but they don't cause these really concerning side effects. So very important, again, to discuss starting medical marijuana with your doctor if you're on any of these. Because again, these are theoretical, but they're what we have right now. So we definitely need to very least we'll want to monitor very closely if anyone starts these. Now, whether to start medical marijuana is one of the questions that people are asking most. So I wanted to go through that and the current recommendations about medical marijuana's place in therapy. And these guidelines are actually from outside of the US. Canada and Australia have both developed medical marijuana guidelines that I'm gonna be referencing. Unfortunately, there's really very little data in transplant specifically. So we're gonna be mostly discussing data about using medical marijuana to treat symptoms that people who have undergone a transplant have, but not really studies specifically um, in patients who have undergone transplant. As of right now, Medical marijuana is not recommended first line in any setting. It's generally recommended as an add-on agent in the third line setting. And these recommendations really go back to the lack of data that we have. As I said before, marijuana's lack of federal legalization makes it very difficult for hospitals and physicians to conduct the really large, robust, good, clinical trials that we t would tell us if marijuana works in different diseases or symptoms. Most of the studies that we have 
use the FDA approved products such as Dronavinol. And as a result, we really only have smaller trials that aren't of high quality for actual medical marijuana. And there are some concerns about using those types of trials. The less patients that you have in a trial, the higher risk of false positives, meaning that marijuana can look like it's effective when it's really not, when it's tested in a larger patient population. And most of these trials are also not blinded, meaning that people know exactly what they're getting and if they're getting medical marijuana or not. And the concern with that is that people experience what we can call the placebo effect, meaning that a person's mind actually attributes that a treatment is beneficial simply because they believe that that treatment should work. But it's not really truly due to the properties of the drug. So essentially, it's another risk of a false positive, like where, this, where we think marijuana works, but truthfully, it doesn't. And these trials also don't have long follow-up times. So it's not really possible to determine the long-term um, efficacy or side effects of medical marijuana when taking it for these different indications. And one of the largest and less issues that I might want to talk about is the variety of doses and preparations that are used in these trials. They all use different products and doses, making it really impossible to know whether a lack of effect or a side effect in a study is due to too low or too high of a dose. And it also means that we really don't know what dose is best for anyone. And that's really why we haven't discussed dosing throughout the presentation much. And that's also one of the main reasons that we hesitate to recommend marijuana in a lot of cases. Our only advice is, again, to start low and increase slowly um, your dose based on symptoms and side effects. And in terms of symptoms that medical marijuana has studies in, the first is nausea and vomiting. I would say that this is probably one of the best studied areas, but most of the studies are looking at the FDA products, Dronabinol and Navalone. And remember, those work on CBD only and have no THC. But these studies have actually seen a benefit in using Dronabinol and Navalone, but not as a first line agent. While they have seen a benefit compared to some other agents, like compazine is one of the ones that I think people are fairly familiar with, and they've also seen a benefit compared to placebo, there's really not data to suggest that it's better than initial therapy. So it tends to be recommended as an add-on agent in a third-line setting. And I particularly like to use it um, in patients who have found medical marijuana to be effective in the past but are unable to use the medical marijuana right now um, for whatever reason as they're in the hospital or something else. And these patients seem to have the best benefit. But the summary of this is that dronabinol and nabilone are good options for nausea and vomiting symptoms if the initial agents don't work, but you won't see them really in the frontline setting. Cancer-related pain is probably one of the other most common symptoms that I get asked about. And not to sound like I'm repeating myself, but medical marijuana is not recommended as a first or second line therapy for cancer-related pain. There are multiple trials out there looking at various medical marijuana products, comparing them to placebos or opioids like oxycodone or Dilaudid. And unfortunately, a lot of these studies aren't designed as well as we would like. So they have a high risk of both false positives and false negatives. And they all use different pain scales or comparisons, making it really difficult to compare them and draw conclusions um, so based up for all of medical marijuana. And of course, pain is subjective. So it's hard to objectively assess pain in any trial. So that's another issue with trials across the board in pain, but it's still an issue with these. So all in all, they need to be taken with a bit of a grain of salt. And that being said, though, quite a few studies have shown a reduction in pain scales when compared to placebo. 
So I do think medical marijuana does have some efficacy in cancer-related pain, but the benefit's less clear when medical marijuana is compared to other opioids. Opioids do seem to work um, as into a similar or better than medical marijuana in these studies. So medical marijuana is unlikely to replace opioids in the long run, but given the higher rate of addiction with opioids and the side effect profile of opioids, I do think that medical marijuana will be a key medication for pain in the future, but we need those studies first to be able to recommend medical marijuana as a first or a second line agent. Um, for now, it's gonna continue to be recommended as a third line agent or as, as, and as an add-on. And in terms of which products to recommend, Canada's guidelines on medical marijuana recommend Navalone or Nabiximol over other agents. But of course, Nabiximol is not approved in the US, so don't forget that part. And to get more specific into different types of pain, I wanted to also discuss peripheral neuropathy. So peripheral neuropathy is that nerve pain that can cause that tingling or burning that's more commonly seen in the hands and feet and can be really severe and can make walking difficult or doing things such as buttoning your shirts or anything like that. And this is a type of pain that we really have very limited treatment options for right now. So I would love if we could use medical marijuana and if it was found to be effective. But right now, medical marijuana is not recommended for peripheral neuropathy caused by cancer um, agents. And, but it can be considered as an add-on agent in the third line because of studies in HIV-related neuropathy. There are not strong cancer really agent-related peripheral neuropathy trials out there right now, but there are those few trials in HIV that have shown lower pain scores when compared to placebo. A few things to keep in mind, though, these trials are very short in duration. And peripheral neuropathy can really be a lifelong issue. So long-term follow-up to make sure that medical marijuana continues to be effective is essential before this can be recommended in the frontline setting. Something else to consider is that the trial showing efficacy used strains that had a lot of THC and results were less consistent with cannabis extracts increasing the risk of side effects such as anxiety, paranoia, and panic, and clearly showing that we need to get the dose right and the product right before we can recommend it more consistently. Um, so for now, it will continue to be an add-on agent in the third line, and you can consider it there. Now, anorexia, or loss of appetite, and cachexia, and that's where there's like a really marked weight loss and you get this muscle loss as well. That's what cachexia is. Can be really common after a transplant. And it's probably one of the other more studied indications for medical marijuana. But most of the studies are looking at the FDA approved products, dronabinol and navalone, that work on CBD only and have no THC. So keep that in mind when you're trying medical marijuana for this indication. The side effects you experience may be really very different than what we saw in the trials using CBD only agents like dronabinol. In terms of where medical marijuana is recommended, here it's not recommended as a first line agent, but it may be beneficial for some patients in the third line setting. And this is mostly because the majority of studies in AIDS related anorexia um, show trends towards increased weight, but there's a probability that that's actually just due to chance alone, since it wasn't statistically significant, and some of those false positives are a big risk in these studies. The study using cannabis extract and THC combo um, didn't show any benefits compared to placebo, so that might have been the dosing or the product. And then there was one, uh, or there's several studies in cancer, but I wanted to draw your attention to one, um, which looked at a first-line agent called Megase, and that was studied and compared to dronabinol in cancer patients. 
And the patients who were taking Megase actually had more of an appetite and weight gain when compared to patients taking Dronabinol. So as patients on the Dronabinol arm did gain some weight and have an increased appetite, Dronabinol probably does also help with anorexia and cachexia, but we can't recommend it as a frontline agent based on this data when we see that Megase is actually working a little bit better. Um, so it's again, it's gonna be a third line agent um, for, who have, for certain patients. And then the last symptom that I wanted to um, talk about was depression and anxiety. So at the moment, medical marijuana is not recommended for either of them. There are limited trials in depression, and the few that we have are in chronic pain. So not really patients who have cancer, and they're looking at the chronic pain part, and the depression is kind of an add-on thing to see um, afterwards. So the studies aren't as, you know, um, focused on the depression as we would like. And these studies, who, which have used nabiximol or nabilone, also didn't find a difference in depression symptoms when compared to placebo. One study actually found that patients had less symptoms of depression when receiving placebos compared to nabiximol. So I never really recommend medical marijuana for depression based on that, that information. There might be some efficacy in anxiety. A small trial in social anxiety disorder did report improvement in symptoms. And there are several studies looking at chronic pain that are also have reported symptom improvement in anxiety. However, these studies really didn't report any baseline anxiety levels. So it's hard to draw any conclusions from these studies. And we really need larger, more robust trials to confirm the efficacy of medical marijuana before it's recommended for anxiety. And now I didn't discuss, I didn't have a slide on this, but I also wanted to talk very briefly on insomnia because I heard that there were quite a few um, questions at another one of the lectures. Um, and medical marijuana has been studied in insomnia, but very similar to what I've been saying um, throughout this is that it's really not recommended in the frontline agents. It's really recommended as an add-on in the third line. Um, but there have been several studies that have shown that um, patients are reporting like subjective improvements in sleep quality, um, but most of these studies are in patients who are in pain. So it's kind of a question of whether the medical marijuana reduce the pain levels, which then made it easier to sleep, or if it's more of a change in the biological sleep pattern. Um, but most of these studies, we're also looking at Sativix, which is that um, agent that's approved in um, Canada, but not in the, US, in the US yet. But it's that spray that has both THC and CBD in, oil, um, CBD in, um, in it. So, Pretty like promising data, but not enough to recommend in that frontline setting. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind with insomnia is that there are some reports that if you stop cannabis um, abruptly, you can get um, you can actually exacerbate insomnia. So kind of keeping that in mind when you're looking at it for this indication or for other ones. And now to switch gears a little bit. And finally, talk about something really specifically related to transplant. Medical marijuana has been studied in one trial to prevent graft-versus-host disease, or GVC. They gave 48 patients cannabidiol for 38 days, in addition to the standard graft-versus-host disease prophylaxis that people normally get. And they compared this to a historical patient who had previously undergone transplant, but didn't receive cannabidiol for prophylaxis. And what they found was that the incidence of graft versus host disease was low at 12%, and severe graft versus host disease was even lower at 5%. So these results, along with the fact that there's no severe side effects were really reported, are really promising. And there are several ongoing trials looking at this more closely However, until we have these trials, 
Medical marijuana is really not recommended for GVC prophylaxis because of these animal models that they looked at. And what they found was that certain white blood cells didn't come back after transplant when exposed to THC, CBD, and cannabis extracts, so really lymphocytes and T cells. And this is one of the biggest concerns in transplant, right? We, because no white blood cells or, or certain ones really dramatically increases your risk of infections. And the stem cells, um, it also increases your risk of the stem cells being rejected by your body. Um, and so we take that really very, very seriously. Now, these are only animal models and there are no human studies available. So I would categorize this as more of a theoretical concern, but one that might not be worth the risk right after transplant. And those animal models and what I just said before are really the reason that we generally recommend avoiding medical marijuana for the first few months after transplant to ensure that your white blood cells completely recover. After that, adding on medical marijuana in the third line setting is very reasonable, but really needs to be discussed with your doctor, particularly because of the side effects and those drug interaction concerns that I, that I kind of um, discussed earlier. I wish I had more to say on dosing, but we really still don't know the best dose or even product for these symptoms. So always start with the lowest possible dose and increase it based on side effects and symptoms. And of course, don't smoke it, whatever you do. We definitely don't want any fungus in the lungs after transplant. In terms of future of the future, I'm really hopeful that we will have more data to guide our recommendations and that we may see medical marijuana recommended more consistently. There are over 200 ongoing trials using medical in a lot of different disease states. So hopefully that can shed some light on this. And the FDA was directed to review the scheduling of cannabis fairly recently in the last few years. If it's rescheduled, then those clinical trials will be a lot easier to conduct and will likely help a lot in determining the best place for medical marijuana. So thank you so much for uh, listening to me and that concludes the presentation. And I'm happy to take any questions that anyone has. Thank you, Dr. Karuli, for this presentation. If you have any questions for Dr. Karuli, please use the chat box in the lower left side of the screen to submit your question. Our first question is, can you discuss any current research on medical marijuana for the BMT or STC survivor? Um, yeah, so... Unfortunately, there's not a lot of data specifically for transplant survivors. Um, there's really just a lot of data about the side effects that we might see. Um, and that's kind of what I was trying to go over a little bit. Um, there's some data in pain, um, cancer-related pain, and there's some data in like nausea vomiting that can happen really commonly, sleep, um, and those types of things. Um, but not really much specifically um, for what, pa what patients after transplant should do. So I wish I had more. Can medical marijuana reduce the inflammatory sclerotic effects of GVHD of the skin and nerves leading to sclerosis and peripheral neuropathy? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we've never studied it for um, GVHD treatment specifically. It does seem to inhibit T cells, which are really one of the big things that are causing graft versus host disease. Um, so that can be a good, a good thing to think about, but right now we don't know. Um, so I, at this point, I probably wouldn't necessarily recommend it. But as I did say before, there is some data in peripheral neuropathy, mostly HIV, um, that it does actually seem to be a benefit in the third line or add-on um, considerations. So that might be a good option to try, um, but just be really careful with those graft versus host disease other medications that you're on. We want to talk about it with your doctor about the interactions that might happen before it's starting it. Do you suggest edible or inhaled marijuana, marijuana for better sleep issues after a transplant? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, 
so the studies have gone all have been all over the place. Um, so really, technically, you can do any of them. What I would say is that the edibles and the orals do tend to last longer, um, so they have like a longer duration of effect. And so if sleep, if staying asleep is the issue, I would probably do an, use an edible or an oral option um, because that way you can kind of stay asleep the entire time. Whereas some of the other ones, like the lotions, the tinctures, sometimes the inhalers and smoking it, they don't necessarily last as long. Um, so that's why I would probably personally err on the side of using an oral or an edible. Um, but again, whatever, theoretically, you can try out any of them. Okay, another sleep question, is it safe to use CBD for long-term insomnia? Yeah, so there's no data to suggest it's not safe. Um, aside from what we just talked about with the different interactions and that stuff to, to think about, um, so I think it's definitely a reasonable option. Um, there are some side effects that do happen with long-term use. You know, we're, we're worried about those impending heart issues that we're starting to see in patients that have had, that have used um, marijuana long-term, so that those heart attacks and stroke risks. Um, so we haven't quite figured out exactly how common that is or how long you, you can use CBD before you get worried about that. Um, so always think about that and think about your own heart history before using it for a really long time. But aside from that, I would say that it, it's definitely a reasonable option to consider for long term. Do you have a preferred method for taking marijuana for patients with stomach or GI issues that have grass versus host disease? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I think it depends a little bit. Um, I don't have a specifically preferred method, but if people can't, you know, eat um, or take something by mouth, you know, if you're throwing it up or something like that, then those tinctures or those patches um, might actually be a better option than trying to take some sort of edible or anything like that. Um, it's really what you could tolerate. Um, if you're having lots of diarrhea or those types of things, sometimes medications don't get absorbed as well because they like move through the GI tract so quickly. Um, so in those cases, it might make more sense to use something like a patch, um, you know, to make sure that it's not really going through the stomach and that you can definitely get that onset um, and trying to avoid those kind of, you know, any, any sort of nausea, vomiting or anything like that, that those can cause too. If you take too much, that might help. Okay, this person's asking about sativa strains of marijuana that give me energy to overcome fatigue and increase activity as I rehab. I'm two years post bone marrow transplant. What should I, what should I be concerned about the daily dose usage? Yeah, I wish I could talk with any sort of intelligence on dosing. You know, it's very, very person specific and we really don't know. Um, so what I, you know, what I would say is always, you know, start low and, and go slow. So like if you're going to try like an edible, take like a quarter of it first, see how it works and wait, you know, about one to two hours and try to take a little bit more and kind of see how you're doing um, from like a pep in your step type of thing uh, before, keep, before trying a little bit more. Um, I wish I had more than that but it's so different depending on the different products and the different even marijuana plants that, you're, that everyone uses. So I really can't give anything more specific than that. Okay, this is a question. Does medical marijuana or street marijuana decrease your overall human, immun, <laughs> immunity? Is there a difference? There's not a difference between medical marijuana and street marijuana in terms of immunity. Um, or in decreasing, like, or acting on, like, your, your, your blood, your white blood cells. Um, the real big difference probably is that we don't, you know, medical marijuana is very, is regulated. So we kind of know exactly what's going on there and what's in there. And we know that there's probably, there's not fungus or those types of things that we always get really concerned about um, people, um, especially people who don't have an immune system. Um, so that's like the big benefit of medical marijuana is it's, it's very, very regulated and you're not going to get anything else in it um, that you might not have that and that might happen with street marijuana, but no difference in um, 
white blood cells or immune responses. Do different forms of the THC marijuana pose different risks to transplant patients? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so technically we don't know. Um, it does look like both um, THC and CBD all inhibit the white blood cells. So I think that that's an equal concern no matter what strain or, or anything that you do in those animal models. Um, so I would say that that's gonna be consistent. But your side effects and your own toleration are going to be a little bit different depending on how much THC is in a product versus CBD. Um, so that's going to be something to factor in. And the, meta the drug interactions are also going to be a little bit different depending on which strains you use. Because each of these agents kind of has different, um, each of THC and CBD kind of act on different parts of the, the metabolism pathways. Um, so you can have more concerns of certain drug interactions depending on um, which ones you're using from a THC to a CBD standpoint. I can't give huge specifics because it's going to really, really depend on the different drug. Um, but that's that's one thing to consider. Yeah, sorry, can you get just as much clinical benefit from using marijuana that does not have the chemicals that causes you to feel high? Yeah, so it depends. Like I, as I I'm unfortunately feel like I keep saying, so I'm sorry about not being able to get specific. Um, but a lot of the studies um, using agents such as dronabinol and nabilone don't have any THC in them, which is what gets you, which is a, kind of that high feeling, and have shown benefits in you know na nausea, vomiting, and anorexia and cachexia and those types of things. So you definitely can have a benefit with less or no THC um, in, the, in them. And we don't really know right now what the exact perfect uh, ratio or um, anything is yet. So I would say that it's definitely a really good first step to see how you do from a symptom management and see if it works with just CBD or less. And then kind of look at, look at the THC components of, or adding in more of that afterwards if you haven't gotten a good effect. Here's another THC question. How does the THC affect the immune system rebuilding after a transplant, specifically a T cell depleted transplant? Yeah, so all of the agents, CBD, THC, um, and cannabis extracts, all prevented white blood cells from reconstituting or coming back in those animal models. So it's going to be, all of them are going to be a concern, theoretically. And again, it's, it's all theoretical. We don't have the human studies available, but nobody really wants to mess with, like, you know, anyone's grass or, like, your stem cells. Um, so I still say that that could be a concern um, for at least the first few months after transplant, um, just while those are coming back. Okay. Is there a clean way to smoke marijuana? I once had a nurse tell me um, it can be baked to kill bacteria. Um, so there's no clean way to, to definitively get rid of every single bacteria that we have. Um, baking it um, or not inhaling it are good options, but certain fungi and certain bacteria can survive even those temperatures. Um, so it's not gonna be an all, like a definite. Um, that's probably why I really, can, like, that's what, one of the reasons why we like medical marijuana the most is they kind of test for those bacteria and fungus to make sure that those aren't there um, or that there's at least um, not those concerning levels. Um, but it would work for certain bacteria, but not all. Okay, it looks like we're running out of time. We might have time for one more question. Are edibles sure. safe with elevated liver panels? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so they are, medical marijuana is metabolized by the liver. So the liver is doing the work. So if your liver isn't working that well, you might have more marijuana and it might not metabolize as quickly. So you might get more side effects. Marijuana itself doesn't seem to really cause elevated liver panels or anything like that. Um, so it's more of a, it, you might need, you'll probably need less and it might last a little bit longer um, if you're gonna take it with an elevated liver panel. Well, thank you. On behalf of BMT InfoNet and our partners, I'd like to thank Dr. Karuli for her very helpful remarks and an excellent presentation.
And thank you, the audience, for your excellent questions. Please contact thank AAT you. Implement if we can help you in any way and enjoy the rest of the symposium. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.